Hey, good afternoon and welcome. I am uh, I'm Jay Loff. I'm the publisher of The Atlantic, uh, here to introduce uh, the next in a series um, that we've been doing on the media crack-up. And this one focuses on the television, television industry, uh, the TV crack-up. And to lead the conversation, I will turn it over today to my uh, esteemed colleague, the editor-in-chief of The Atlantic, uh, James Bennett. James? Thanks for coming. Um, we all, probably just about everybody in this room, grew up with a, a, a very stable and predictable and therefore kind of uh, comforting model of what television is. It was something that was arrived in half hour and or hour long packages at very specific times of the day, specific days of the week. And we all gathered vast numbers of us around on our couches around the country at the same time. And out of that, uh, predictability grew a kind of powerful shared cultural experience. Um, and to this day, you can mention certain names like MASH or Walter Cronkite and pluck um, the same emotional chords, I think, in huge numbers of people. Uh, uh, today, a as a consumer, um, I'm completely bewildered by television. It's, it's hard to know what to watch or, or when to watch it or even, or even how to watch it. Um, the industry trying not to go the way of the music industry is struggling to figure out what it is people want, how best to deliver it, uh, and how to make money on it. It's very hard to separate those three questions, the, the, the message, the medium, and monetization. Um, but I'm hoping, because we have such an extraordinary group here, to focus at least at the outset of the conversation today on the, on the programming piece of it, the actual content uh, and where that's headed. Um, because it's, the, it's what we as consumers most uh, experience and value and, and I'm hoping for it, an impassioned conversation about uh, the future of uh, a medium with which we all have a really intimate uh, relationship. Um, it would be impossible to do justice in the time, in all the time we have to introductions of this group, so I'm not gonna do justice to their introductions <laughs> uh, very quickly. Um, David Weston is president of, of ABC News. Andrea Wong is president and CEO of Lifetime Entertainment. Uh, uh, Michael Eisner is Michael Eisner. <laughs> uh, and uh, also the impresario behind Toron Tornante, um, uh, a new media company. Michael Jackson is the uh, chief content strategist uh, for ICA. Um, IAC. IAC, rather, I'm sorry, IAC. Uh, and I'd like to just plunge right into the conversation, Andrea, if we could, I'd like to start with sure. you. Um, much has been made about the decision to move Jay Leno uh, to 10 o'clock mm -hmm. on NBC. And I'm wondering what your read is on what it means and what success or failure of that show in that time slot portends uh, uh, for network television. Sure. I think um, to start with, from NBC's perspective, there were two key reasons that they did this and that it made sense for them. The first was a competitive reason, which was to keep it off an, to keep Jay Leno off another network at 1135, and there were many bidders for that. Uh, so to keep him at NBC, and then the second reason was economic to replace um, the 10 o'clock dramas five days a week with a daily strip talk show was a significantly cheaper proposition and uh, therefore, for if you look at the straight profit of that time period, they can make a tremendous amount of money in that time period, uh, even if the ratings are significantly lower than, than the dramas uh, that they originally had. So if it works, um, uh, Michael Jackson, what do you think? It, do you think we'll see all the other networks quickly following suit with similar programming in prime time? It, it's an interesting strategy because the great thing about television networks was that they own time slots. In, a, in, a, in an age of scarcity, these time periods which people bought and sold were incredibly valuable. Not only because you sold advertising time, but because you created content which had an incredibly valuable life. ER has made hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, and what they've essentially done is to take the high cost, high risk strategy of creating expensive and valuable original content and sort of thrown in the towel. And they're making low, low cost, 
low risk, low reward programming, the Jay Leno hour. And in, in a way, it's like the Maginot line of television. They've sort of uh, said, this is just too hard for us with a number four network. Uh, we'd rather just retire gracefully. And what, you know, your question is, what does it mean? I think it means that network television, which was, after all, a part of American mass culture, you know, that started in the 40s and grew to prominence in the 50s, is not over by any means, but is drawing in its horns, uh, partly because mass culture isn't what it was. We live in a more tribal age. And partly because uh, time, that commodity that we just spoke of, is just much less scarce. There's so much time to be bought and sold. And just what, what, one thing that is going to be interesting to see is what this program is. Uh, and I would mm. say this, that if, 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 if this new Jay Leno program is uh, the same old Jay Leno program that we know and quite liked before, then I think it's not going to be a success. Uh, the, 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 there is a Jay Leno that I think might work, which is the Jay Leno that interviewed Hugh Grant and what was his, uh, his first question was something like, what were you thinking? And, and, and I think there might be a place for a sort of national confessional come comedy hour where Mark Sanford and, and Hugh Grant and uh, Elliot Spitzer and indeed Barack Obama who you know very successfully used uh, the Jay Leno show uh, the other week and Jay Leno actually was quite good with him and so that kind of show that's a cross between the Jay Leno that we know and love and the sort of 60 minute dateline kind of thing could be, could be interesting, but unless it has some real reason for being and impetus, it's just a piece of old-fashioned television. David, that sounds like Jay Leno would be crossing into your world a little bit, and uh, do, do you think that in a sense that is the future of, 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 of news analysis and, um, and, and news interviewing in, in this country, that, that there's got to be an element of entertainment and, and circus to make it work? On, on television, particularly on the networks? And the simple answer is no. I don't think we have to be a circus. I, I think that um, long before Jay Leno was talked about for 10 o'clock, we already had Jon Stewart and, and Stephen Colbert and people like that moving into that space. Mm -hmm. and, and one could argue that some of what one sees on cable news channels um, has a certain amount of um, entertainment value to it. Um, so that's been happening, and that's just fine. The, the question is not whether that will happen and that will be successful. The question is, is there room left for someone to try to do straight ahead news and not, not news analysis, news reporting and substantive interviews and enterprise journalism? I mean, I, I, I want to believe that there is room for that, but time will tell. I don't predict the future. Michael Eisner, can I bring you in on the, the, the same set of questions, which in a sense also sum to are the networks ultimately doomed? Well, I was trying to think of an analogy of what it, Leno meant you know, with Michael Jackson's articulate answer, particularly with an English accent. I got nervous with the first analogy that came to my mind, so I looked for another. And I came up with Moss Hart's description in the beginning of Act One when he's lying listening to a man dying next to him with a death rattle. And I've never read anything that described the death rattle in such a frightening way. So I would say that Jay Leno going at 10 o'clock was kind of the death rattle analysis that you can look to network television. It doesn't really matter whether he's funny or not, if, in the broader sense, whether he's the real Jay Leno or, or uh, you know, a ABC News type Jay Leno. The, the era of mediocre content being acceptable to vast amounts of people for great financial reward is over, I think. And um, it seems to me that the current broadcast uh, package, I mean, when we bought Capital Cities ABC, we valued the network at zero. So we even thought then that the value of the network was pretty limited. Uh, we valued the stations quite aggressively. And even though I'm an alumni of ABC twice, I still think they're doing it. The, the only ones that are doing it the right way, they are investing heavily in local news. 
and the other networks, for cost reasons, are running to hills and cutting out local news. And all that's going to be left, frankly, the mainstay of local broadcast television is going to be localism. And I think ABC, Capital Cities, Disney sees that. As far as Jay Leto going at 10 o'clock, uh, in, 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 well, I'll, I'll end. That's it. <laughs> I, I mean, I have one name. I'll go back. All right. In my first, do you want to hear this? Let me, let me actually no. see. Let me, I do want to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> I, if, if you're hesitant about it, then. No, no, um, I, I just we'll have a theory about what's happening. Well, please, let's hear it. No, I, but it's convoluted. All right. In my first, <laughs> my first life in the media in 1826, uh, when there were three networks, there was a theory of the least objectionable program. So you had the big hits, uh, whether it was the Red Skeletons or that's even earlier, or you know, MASH, say that era, Happy Days, Cosby. Uh, the big hits made the big money for the for the, the, the owners, and the mediocre shows still got on. They were the least objectionable programming. Uh, and I'm excluding news here for the moment, but it was very highly regarded because it was scarce. My next era was the era of uh, the, the beginning of home video, cable, satellite, worldwide. Here again, the high-end product got the most money, made a lot of money for its, its uh, constituencies. The mediocre programming still got sold. Mm -hmm because there was such an appetite worldwide, whether it was in Germany or England or the US or in Comcast or in whatever. Now we're in this new era, when you ask about Cosby, where the consumer controls the, what's, what's being watched. And here, mediocre programming is over. It's just over. And the only really valuable program that you're going to make money on is the high quality. I'm not talking about necessarily expensive but the high quality programming. Well, and this is where I may be misunderstanding high quality in this context, but I think of the high quality television, Andrea, maybe you could, as increasingly taking place in a niche environment on cable, and it shows like The Sopranos that become hits, but, but don't have monstrous viewership in the way we used to understand a big hit. And the, the relatively successful programs are, um, reality shows, which seem to be proliferating and basically taking over the television landscape. Um, is I mean, that an accurate assessment of what's happening out there? No, I mean, I, I agree with Michael. I think high quality content is critical. I think there's two things that crit are really critical to any media company or content company going forward, and it's the strength of your brand um, and uh, great high quality content that goes along with that brand. And if you have those two things, regardless of what the platform is and regardless of how distribution evolves, you ought to be able to figure out how to monetize it. Um, with respect to what is high quality content, I mean, you could argue that it is the, the content that people want and therefore, you know, and, then, and, and it's subjective what quality means. I mean, you could say Mad Men is a very high quality show. I can tell you they're losing a huge amount of money on Mad right. Men right now, so the economics don't really work, but it's certainly, defines the brand of AMC, and so to the point of the strength of your brand, it's well worth it in, in making that investment. So, and on the other hand, you know, some people might argue that American Idol is a very high quality show and a highly profitable show. Some, some people might look at it and say it's a reality show and therefore it's not high quality. So, um, you know, I would argue that American Idol, Idol and Dancing with the Stars and shows like that are very high quality shows. I think there's going to, but, there are going to be two forms of television going forward that, that matter. One is going to be what some version of a network, whether or not it's ABC is irrelevant or NBC or whatever, which is the stuff that you want to watch today and talk about tomorrow, which, which might be a presidential debate or American Idol or the Oscars uh, uh, to do with liveness and the water cooler effect. And I think that's always been a great feature of television, and I don't see that going away. Whether or not we're talking about a television which is stuck to your living room wall or a screen on a desk is irrelevant now. It's just that, 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 that that's a primal satisfaction of television, and it's something, and what I think you'll increasingly see the networks becoming just those kinds of shows, because it's going to be harder and, I mean, 
Hmm. Think of the titles of reality shows. They're very legible. American Idol, The Bachelor, the, what's the dancing show called? Dancing with the Stars. Dancing with the Stars. <laughs> it's not hard to understand what those shows are about. Whereas if you think about some of the dramas that have just been launched in, on American television in the last year, you know, uh, mm -hmm. King, what's that about? The Mentalist, you know, th th they're all opaque. Uh, and they're very hard to get right, and it's very much, it's, it's, it's even more of a casino and a high cost casino. Um, and then I think the other, um, and by the way, many of those shows, like American Idol, are absolutely classical forms. I mean, American Idol, if you think about it, goes back to vaudeville. It, it is a talent show, and it's now been tricked up with, you know, uh, viewers being able to vote from home and a mean. English guy who gives it a kind of contemporary kind of edge. But it's a very classical form. Television is composed of very classical forms by and large. And then the other form of television I think we're going to see are things like Mad Men, Sopranos, some situation comedies like The Office, which are the, you know, that which television has probably best given our culture, which is great drama, great comedy. Which, 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 which speaks to us and tells us about who we are. And I don't think that is going away. It may be that the way that the audience acts collectively may do away with the business model that affords it, which, 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 which could be a problem. But, 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 but um, the, the de anyway, my, my point is that the desire for stuff that you can, you can watch, that large numbers, of, large numbers of people can watch together, and stuff which is great by any comp comparative standards is going to continue. See, I think that is very dangerous. And were I still relevant and running a network, I would do the opposite. Um, even if you look at the new world, the DVD world, excuse me, the TiVo world, homes that have TiVo are watching about 15% more television across the board than homes that don't have TiVo. That just simply says people that like television watch more television. Hit shows are getting 60% more audience lost. Uh, what are the other hit shows? Desperate Housewives, Grey's Anatomy. Anatomy. That's in program ratings. Now, that doesn't mean TiVo will say maybe 60% of the people, 50% of the people are fast forwarding through the commercials, but that's still 50% of the people that are watching the commercials. The rest of the ABC schedule and the rest of everybody's schedule, the mediocre shows, are not getting anybody TiVoing. So if your theory is to dumb down television, and for every American Idol and Dancing with Stars, there are 20 shows that you would embarrass to have your dog watch. So there are, there are only a couple. I mean, you mentioned the few that are at the top, you know, those survivor type shows and eating things are not my type of show. If your strategy were to, to align yourself with the best talent, try to do the best comedy, and I'm talking about the broadcast networks, not the, just the dual revenue stream, or you know, dual revenue stream is also a misnomer because there's some things like CNBC, which makes a lot of money in news. They have infomercials where they make a lot of money, but that's another subject. If you're going for the gold and you hit, the gold becomes platinum. And for all time, hit television, hit movies, hit restoration comedies, hit restoration dramas, hit Greek drama, they live forever. And this idea that you have to do reality programming on broadcast television is just going to be a self-fulfilling prophecy of doom. So how in this environment do you set out to create a hit? How do you build a hit? Uh, uh, my own suggestion in this category would be The Real Housewives of Aspen, by the way. I can't believe nobody's done that show so far, just walking around town. Um, well, that is, that is, I mean, that is. I know, I know. I mean, I'm, I, it's the race I, to the bottom. My I'm wife trying. is sitting there, so I'm going to tell the story for the last time, Jane, I promise. I go to a, a Disney movie or a Paramount movie, and it's terrible, right? And Jane turns to me and says, how could you make that movie? How did you do that? And I say, well, you know, I went and tried to find the worst script, the worst director, and the worst <laughs> cast, and put a fortune into it, and look, we succeeded. <laughs> I mean, 
Making content is hard work, and it is not something that you can do with your left hand. I know everybody in America is a decorator, and everybody in America writes poetry, and every American in America is a movie maker, but they really are professionals, and, uh, and they're not just people that have done it 22 times, because some of those people have too many wives and too many beach houses, and they're too expensive. But there are a lot of people, big country, there are a lot of people, if you have good editors, not necessarily good computers, but good editors that can understand what's funny and what's not and what's emotional and what's not, you end up, on occasion, doing things that are extraordinary. When we decided after the financial interest rule was vacated that ABC would own its own programming because we believed in this concept of going for the gold, it was very controversial. We went $180 million into the toilet. Everybody said it was stupid. And then we had all these hits and worldwide revenues, and it became an excellent strategy. So it really is about what is the show? And I know the argument of distribution over content and is content king or queen and who's what and where. It is going to prove more and more as the audience has more and more possibilities, more selections for the internet, through digital downloads, through all of those things and all the changing technologies, it is going to be the better content that wins for every owner. And if the owner doesn't recognize that, he will be replaced by a new owner, in my opinion. Does everybody here agree with that? Yes. In fact, you could argue that, the only, that there's no point in owning a broadcast network unless you're owning your studio and you're owning all the content you're putting on the broadcast network, or as much as possible. But uh, to come back to the point you made earlier about brand identity, um, uh, I couldn't even, and this is, this is an embarrassing statement about me, I actually couldn't tell you what network originates Law & Order, for example. All I know is it's always on television. Um, and I couldn't even tell you what, when it's new as opposed to when it's a repeat. It's never near. <laughs> Well, they're brands and they're brands. Right. The networks aren't brands. Uh, Disney is kind of a brand uh, of a kind. Nickelodeon's a brand. Uh, I would even say Lifetime's not really a brand, although women know about it. She does a great I show. I with that, but. Well, it's a brand in <laughs> yes. that certain demographics know it exists. Yes, yeah, so there, there's an affinity there's for identity. it by a certain group of the pop set, set of the population. ESPN's a brand. Yeah. ESPN's a brand. Jay Leno's a brand. Right. Yeah, and Barbara the personalities, exactly. Right. But they wouldn't come to your brand unless you had a good show on it. No, that's not true. They would come to, Mar to Lifetime because they know they like the movies, and they know they're going to find a movie on a Saturday afternoon that's going to make them happy. Well, it better be a good movie then. Yeah, I agree with you. That's what we're trying to fix right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> but you're also developing sitcoms. Sitcoms, dramas, um, and now we're trying to build a reality beachhead there. So, But uh, yes, I think that brands can be anything from ch networks to personalities to shows themselves. So on the broadcast networks, the shows are the brands. Michael Jackson, do you see it the same way? Yeah. So it's the real power of the, of the brand that still draws viewers to a given channel? <laughs> it, it, it depends. I mean, what, I mean, to Andrew's point earlier, why is AMC making uh, Mad Men because AMC is a disparate collection of, of movies uh, and that's going to be disaggregated soon. I mean, we're not going to need linear networks to give us movies. So they are investing in a loss leader, a very good loss leader, in order to try to create some kind of presence that hopefully just might protect them uh, in an age when channels get possibly disaggregated. So. Uh, but, but, I mean, there are all sorts of different kinds of brands, as, as, as people have said. And some networks have brands, some don't. Aren't they going to AMC now because they hear there's a very good show about advertising the 50 called Mad Men? And FX got made because a show called The Shield, and then Nip Tuck got on there. And these, these cable networks, which were kind of demographic brands of a kind, started to come of, of age when they put on programs that had a real quality and uniqueness. I would say that HBO never came 
into its own. It was a redistribution brand of movies until Sex and the City and uh, Sopranos. Actually, before that, Larry Sanders. And Larry Sanders. Larry Sanders, I think, was the first one. But it is the content that drove it the brand. Defines, it sure. defines the brand. Right. And if you're talking about the crack of a television, which is what this panel's about, it is what is it that is going to... The, the appetite for entertainment is greater today than it's ever been. But it's more selective. And it's controlled by the audience. So if you are in the business and want to make money, one, you've got to come up with a new financial model. Because if the mediocre product won't work, you better not put A talent, that, excuse me, you better put A talent and B pricing into your product. You can't afford the kind of pricing you could afford in that second generation of my life where everything was available to be sold. And like water rising to a level, talent, agents, directors got so much of the cream that if they kept getting that cream going into the mediocre content, and by the way, you don't know when you're going to have mediocre content, therefore you have to make all content less expensive, so the mediocre content is acceptable, and the, less, and the great content you make more money at. It's just you need a new financial box with this new technological revolution. And if you find the box and you find the talent, you're going to make a fortune. I'm going to ask one or two more, but if, if people have questions, there are microphones on, on either side, and um, please join this conversation. Um, so you raise the question of what that financial model is going to be. Um, uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts, anybody who wants to take this one on, what the emerging model, if anything, is. Who is going to pay for content? Michael? Well, in the end Ma of the day, Michael Jackson, let's go yeah, to the other know. Michael. <laughs> well, the model at the moment is brand advertising. That, that ain't going away. There's still a lot of that around. Uh, the model is subscription. Uh, you know, what's happened to boxing? Boxing has moved from free TV, funded by advertising, to being something that people pay $50 a fight for. That works with stuff that people know that they want to see. It doesn't work with stuff that people don't know about yet. And then the real challenge for television is what happens if the cable package, the bundling of many channels that we all pay an astronomical amount for, gets disaggregated. Because at that point, because all expensive content is paid for by bundling of one kind or another. Uh, you know, movies are bundled. Studios don't make one movie, they make 12 movies a year. They have a back catalog of movies. Barnes & Noble doesn't just sell bestsellers. It sells bestsellers as a lost leader for its back catalog. Y you, you can't just pay for uh, one drama series. No one's going to spend two or three million dollars an episode for 13 episodes of a drama. Uh, you need to uh, be investing over a suite of different products. And that becomes very difficult. Just to spread your risk. To spread your risk, absolutely. And that becomes very, very difficult. And, and, and the way that that happens at the moment is that we all pay for our cable or satellite packages, and that affords a great deal of content, right? Um, it also allows huge profits. You know, the, the, the markup of a USA network or whatever is something like 50%. It's a, fantastically profitable business. Um, if, for example, uh, these channels disaggregate, you know, the, if, if in a sense the cable subscription is the landline of the future, and, and, and as we know, young people are moving away from landlines towards cell phones. Maybe they move away from cable subscriptions to Hulus of this world, or they don't care that much about whether or not they see a television program today, they're happy to wait for it in some other window. Then the funding of television just becomes enormously difficult. I suppose what you might then see are a series of HBO-like subscription channels that we're prepared to pay a lot for because they are brands, because they have things that, that are reliably good on them. Uh, but I think that is a genuine challenge that no one really knows as far as I know, the answer to. Please, if anybody has a question, now's your, now's your moment. Um, if Michael Eisner, you were, you were quoted um, somewhere last year saying that uh, 
uh, online video uh, is following a very familiar arc, basically. It starts with uh, pornography and Nickelodeon uh, that people are willing to pay for, and then eventually you get Ben-Hur. Um, how close are we, do you think we are to now to getting to Ben-Hur, and is that going to ultimately wipe all of the rest of this stuff away? Well, it won't wipe it away just like any new technology has not wiped away the old. You end up with one and one adding up to three, or one and one and one adding up to five. You know, the, 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 the motion picture, radio did not uh, dissipate and end the motion picture, television did not end radio, cable did not end television. It's, it's, it, they add up together and make a great industry. The others become maybe somewhat smaller or different, radio changes, uh, but it's still there. The internet, uh, story-driven internet forms uh, are really in the infancy. The advertisers are a little nervous about it. You know, I'm making shows for $2,000 a minute, $3,000 a minute. My son is directing a Budweiser commercial for a million two for a 30. People have told me it should be reversed. I should get the million two, he should get the 2,000. I like the 2,000. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna gear up to about 30 of these a year. When I'm about 120, years old, it'll probably be the dominant uh, <laughs> thing. But, you know, something interesting, uh, when I read the, the name of this panel, a person that's been working with me for almost 40 years said, didn't you give a speech on this? And I said, yeah, I, yeah sometime. We dragged it out. I gave a speech 30 years ago on this very subject. I'm not going to do the speech, obviously. Of the media crack up? Yeah, the end of the media, the end of content, the end of the world, the end of creativity, you know, that sort of stuff. <laughs> so, so I read it. I actually read it 10 minutes ago. So I was a little, sort of like my final exams. But it is unbelievable, because I started off talking about going to the Consumer Electric, this is, by the way, 29 years ago. I'm going to the Consumer Electronics Show, and I'm nervous. You know, I'm nervous because I don't know what to expect. And I'm wandering around, I'm talking about I'm wandering around, and all I see there are video discs and video cassettes and home earth stations and 100 channel cable systems and electric toys and car phones and giant screen TVs and telephones so small they made Dick Tracy's wife and so forth. And so I'm, I'm talking about going around like a kid in a store, but it, it's not content, it's all these new things that everybody's talking about. And I'm, um, I don't know whether Paramount, which is where I'm working at this time, should attach ourselves to CEDs, I don't even know what that means, from RCA or to VHDs or JVCs or better, should we attach ourselves to CLVs or DVAs? These were all in the lingo at this time. DVA being a joint venture between MCA and IBM, <laughs> whatever that was. Uh, you know, everything's from Japan, should I be learning how to speak Korean, I'm talking about. RCA and Toshiba across the aisle from each other, Radio Shack, Sanyo, Sears, Half these companies are gone. Mashusta, Magnavox, all this stuff is going on. Uh, I proudly announce that two million cassettes were sold in the United States that year. And a million more this year. This is like a big thing, I think. Video cassettes. Video cassettes. Oh, DVDs were long from coming. We duplicated 1.2 million cassettes this year as opposed to 600,000 the year before. So this is a technological revolution going on. Uh, I'm lamenting about the international balance of payments. So you could just be wandering around here, the same lament is going on. Uh, I then hit cable. There's a little section for cable. And I'm talking about ESPN, which is like 20,000 subscribers. TMC, HTN, I don't know, these still around. HHT, USA, sorry, no lifetime. Uh, Select TV, they're going on TV. Uh, MS, MDSs, I don't know what that is. Uh, everywhere is technology. Everybody is, there's no place for us. Uh, SATCOM 1 has just gone up. Everybody's all excited about the satellite. You know, everything is foreign. So we're all nervous. It's all foreign. Everybody's saying America's over. And I'm trying to find out where Paramount is. And then I'm going through, we in the content business, Paramount, 1929, Paley at CBS, Paramount merged. Nobody remembers that. Paramount and, and, they merged and then the, the depression hit and Paley got rid of Paramount because the networks were it and content wasn't working. In 1964, Paramount started the first television station, thinking, oh my God, we have to have TV stations. They lost that. 
then the government split off Paramount. All these things that happened over the years, which are still being talked about. Then they started International Telemeter Corporation, first pay television in 1949. That failed. So all this stuff. Then they start to get to an experiment where the people were experimenting, and now they wanted Bob Hope. As soon as they brought Bob Hope into it, it started to work. But fast, fast forward a little bit. <laughs> all right, bit. I go to you, the are end. You saying that, are you saying that oh, wait, uh, I'm gonna, all right, there's just nothing new under this? No, I'll get to my point. <laughs> In this thing 28 years ago, at the CES show, the main floor was technology and pornography. The studios were in a little room, a third the size of this room, in the basement. The next year I talk about going back, the same technology, but on every screen was Warren Beatty. On every screen, on every sample screen of these sets was Warren Beatty and all the current Hollywood product. So they were selling all their technology by the content that was being made. So I conclude at the end that what will happen, and it has happened, is that people working in technology we will create new Rockefellers, new Vanderbilts, new those people. They will happen with the Bill Gateses and the Eric Schmitz and all those people. So all this technology happened, and then I won't go into it, but then I talk about what has lasted all this period, and then I talk about the number of remakes of great projects that went on. And at the very end, I conclude that the only solution to this problem for Paramount and then Disney, which I then decided to adapt to Disney, I say maybe in five years I'll be speaking about pictures or wristwatches, but the, whether it's on a 25 millimeter screen or a 25 foot screen, it is all still entertainment, all still to need the basic values of story, plot, and interpersonal relationships. So my point 30 years ago, I have the same point today, is who knows exactly how this is all going to be monetized, but you're better off having great stories on which to put that which you want monetized than going for the lowest common denominator. So content is the king, essentially. Always more has now been and more than, than ever. ever. But tastes are changing so radically. Our idea of what... And, and, and I may be wrong about this, but you can go a long way with a skateboarding cat today. Or no, a, you can't. Um, Please. No, I think people still want to be told a story. Yeah, exactly. Well, what skateboarding cats? Well, they're gone. <laughs> well, Andrea, <laughs> Andrea, complete the thought. Though. Well, I mean, David and I were talking about this this morning, that fundamentally that's never going to change the appetite and desire for people to be entertained and to be told a story. Uh, will never go away. For, for all time to come. And so as long, if you can continue to tell great stories, and by the way, if you look at a lot of movies today and television shows, these stories are somewhat similar to stories that were told 25 and 50 years ago. When Andrea was creating Dancing with the Stars, and I was there, and I hated everything she was doing before that, because I, I hated all that reality stuff, and she said, no, we're going to tell stories. This show is going to tell stories. And it does. Yes. Which is why that show works. Right. But given that, David, well, I mean, you know, uh, um, great journalists, this is what they do. They tell compelling stories about real people. If they want to be successful. If yeah. they want to be successful. Why are we so worried? Well, there's change, and change is always worrying. But it goes back to, I do agree with what Michael said. Um, the, the difference is there's been a lot of journalism being done that people have consumed just because they had to, because there wasn't any alternative. You don't have to anymore. You can pick the parts you want. You can find the story you want. You can find the person you want. And in that world, the target's very narrow, but the real problem is if you miss the target, you're off the edge of the world. It used to be that you could sort of miss the target by a little bit and you're still doing okay. Right now, you have to really go after stories that are compelling and that are valued by people and that make a difference to them, and you have to tell them in a compelling way if you're, if you're going to survive. Now, I personally think if you do that, then you'll be fine, and the business people will figure out how to get paid for it. And there'll be a lot of ways to get paid for it. I don't think there's one single model that will prevail. And if you don't do that, you, you're dead no matter how good the business model is, and no matter how clever your technical people are and your engineering people. Now, so it's simple, really, really hard, but simple. And, it, and in, in journalism, in, in, in news, it has severe ramifications on the stories we cover and how we cover them, because not all stories are created equally. Uh, Interestingly, in news, newspapers me, made money, but Broadcast law, news was a yeah. lost leader right. in broadcasting until CBS found 60 Minutes. And then when ABC found 2020 and its other shows, 
that is when news, I mean, when I got back into ABC, they were making $100 million a year in news because they had learned how to take the medium and apply it to good storytelling in right. a f news factual way. Right. But it also requires, Michael, that you take a look at your news organization and focus it on the stories that are of real value to people that they appreciate, rather than just uh, like a blunderbuss hitting all the stories equally. Because some of those stories just aren't worth it. I said it last night, you know, a hurricane comes up the Gulf, and the fact is you can show the video from the last hurricane and nobody's gonna know it. There's some guy on the beach getting blown, getting rained on, and there are people putting up plywood and buying hand, canned goods. Anderson Cooper. And the, and the flip side is, the flip side is, you can spend as much money as you want. You can spend 10 or 15 million dollars covering a hurricane, and not one single American is going to say, "Okay, I'm going to come to ABC News from now on because they just cover hurricanes." But so you have to make some tough decisions about how you allocate your resources. You need to allocate it toward things that are memorable and that are valuable to people. Jennifer, please. Um, I have a question for that I'd love each of you to answer, which is you see a lot of what's going on out there and in the marriage of media, of content, business model, and platform, what are you all looking at and watching that you think is the most interesting form that's coming up or most interesting thing that someone's doing? Well, okay, I'll start for news in a, in a critical way. Um, I said this earlier when we were talking. The, the most remarkable thing I've found in cable news, I think, is if you'd gone back 30 years before there was 24-hour cable news, much less four or five or six of them, and you said, we're going to have four or five or six of these things going 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the one thing you would have predicted for sure is that somebody would stumble across some truly new format for news. And I don't see it in all cable news. And, and I don't know why that is. I don't have an explanation for that. But frankly, there's nothing new that's come out of that. And that's surprising. There's no 60 Minutes. There's no Nightline. That were different genres when they were invented. They were a different form of news telling. And I haven't seen that. I mean, cable, I mean you know, cable news is an oxymoron. <clears throat> you know, there is no news on cable. Uh, if you look at MSNBC and Fox, they don't have any news. It's largely they have entertainment. a tutanization and heat and drama. And CNN has some news some of the time. But... Uh, you have more news in your two nightly shows than, than Fox News. It's, they're not in that business. Mm -hmm. And in a curious way, and, and sadly, uh, you know, the television newscast has itself, is, is, is I think, a form that isn't going to survive. It's not really, it is a, uh, it's a form created by a half-hour slot, not a form created by a consumer desire. But, so in a, in a, in a weird way, news and television are probably less of a marriage than ever before. You know, if, you, if you're interested in a big story, you're gonna deep dive with all of the tools that the web uniquely can provide you with from video to social networking to reporting, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, if I could just respond to that, because I don't necessarily disagree, but I might have a slightly different. First of all, I don't know about the evening news, because I came to Cap Cities ABC in the early, in February of 1991, and I think the first day I walked in the door, somebody said, you know, the evening newscast is dead. It's a dinosaur. Now, that was 18, 19 years ago, and it's still around. So I, I'm pretty modest about predicting the future because I'm just not sure it changes. The question is, that you raise is the right one, which is, is there a consumer demand or need or appetite for a daily summary of the news that's well produced? And I don't know the answer to that question. But if you look at other programs, such as, for example, the morning programs like Good Morning America, it's quite different. Mm -hmm. my, my hypothesis is it's different because you've been sleeping all night. And so you haven't been listening to the radio, you haven't been on the internet, you haven't been watching cable news, you and you sort of want to know, is the world still together? I mean, what happened overnight? What should I know for the day? And the other thing that's a little bit of an example to the contrary, but it may, may not uh, be a bellwether for things, is Nightline, is the resurgence of Nightline. Because when Ted Koppel left Nightline, people widely predicted it was gone. And Nightline has grown. And last week it actually beat both Conan O'Brien and um, Letterman in total viewers and was number two in the demos that people wouldn't have predicted. So I, I, I'm, I'm a little more modest about the predictions, but you may well be right. We have another question yeah. up here. Uh, hi, I have a question. Uh, I'm Rob Gregory. I'm with the Plum TV Network. We're channel 16 here in Aspen. And if anybody should do Desperate Housewives of Aspen, it should be us. <laughs> and I think we're going we're gonna to do that show, so whoever suggested that, if we can work something out uh, later. Just like a modest commission. Yeah, exactly. uh, right, okay, that'd be fine. And uh, we're also in the Hamptons, Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard, Telluride, uh, Vail, is Sun there a Valley pattern to that? Yeah. <laughs> Miami Beach. Yes. And, we, and we, we are all about hyper-localism. And we have young kids creating TV for the people, by the people, in these great communities like Aspen. And 
we, we, you know, we've been able to take advantage of Final Cut Pro and the YouTube generation and all these cheap, great cameras and this great editing technology. So I just want to sort of ask the panel where you guys think this hyper-local approach to this kind of community television is going in the future. Well, okay, I'll, I'll go first. I think hyper-local, and this is not original to me, but I certainly embrace it. I think hyper-local is, is a huge opportunity. The fact is, if you look at consumption of news, the one thing that has grown substantially and consistently has been local. That doesn't mean necessarily the ratings for individual television station in their news has grown, because there have been more and more stations that come into the market. So you've had five, six, seven local newses. But overall, the appetite for local news is enormous. And that's before you get to hyper-local. So I think there's an enormous opportunity. I think the question is not, is that an opportunity for growth in the future? The question is, who is best to try to fulfill that? Is it going to be the local television stations? Newspapers, it looks like right now, not so much in a lot of places, but, but who knows? Or is there some web thing that comes along? But, I, but the question of the consumer demand or appetite, as Michael talked about, I personally think is clearly there for hyperlocal. Anybody else want to weigh in on that? Andrew, do you regard that as any sort of a competitive issue? the rise of, 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 of hyper-local programming? No, I don't think about it in that context. I, I agree with, with uh, David. Um, I, I, only have a, a, as, I only have an opinion as an outsider in the business. Um, and I agree with Michael that I think a, the ABC stations are the only ones doing the right thing, investing in local news right now, because that appetite will never go away either. I, I'd like to ask a version of, of, of more, a, a, a version of the question Jennifer just asked a minute ago, keyed off something you guys said earlier, which is um, content is king. People really still want storytelling, powerful storytelling. Um, uh, who's doing it? Uh, who, is, who is really reinventing the form and creating some um, new kind of storytelling that is going to, is defining the path into the future for all of us? Or is it going to be the same sort of cop drama, the same sort of stories we're accustomed to, um, adventure tales that go all the way back to Homer? Is, is, there, is there something new under the sun here? The one thing I, and I'll speak as the news guy and let the entertainment people uh, correct me, the one thing I push back at on a little bit in this whole conversation is my experience is when you start programming by genre, you're in trouble. A, a good story is a good story. And it may be a cop drama. It may not be a cop drama. And as soon as you're saying, should we have reality or should we have drama, or should we have sitcom, or the same thing is true in news. I mean, should we be doing foreign stories, should we have domestic stories, or should we be doing medical stories, whatever. My experience is a good story is a good story. And if you've got good people, they know the difference. And if you don't, you get new people. Uh, but I think it's a little dangerous to be talking about these broad categories because, you, 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 I mean, we don't have the luxury of rejecting any alternatives for the source of good stories. Now correct me, entertainment folks. <laughs> well, I, I like very much that the old categories of newspaper, radio station, television station are breaking down, you know, uh, that uh, a newspaper can do a podcast which is as good as any radio show, that newspaper websites sometimes have great video the, 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 these professional categorizations that we all grew up with are eroding, and the web is absolutely the fulcrum for that. And out of that is going to come stuff from left field. Uh, I think YouTube is a fantastic thing. It is a, cornu you know, a, a cornucopia of riches, uh, and, and it is absolutely... It absolutely underlines the fact that in this modern age, the cost of something and the value of something uh, are, are disaggregated. You know, you, there are some incredibly valuable things uh, that something like YouTube provides that, that cost nothing, and some very, very expensive things that network television provides that are value less. And I think that is a great feature of this world that we find ourselves in. And a question up there. Uh, I'm Xander Barron from The Atlantic. Uh, I have a question for David. I thought the observation earlier that Broadcast networks in particular really aren't brands in themselves very much anymore is interesting because they used to be. NBC's brand used to be Friends and Seinfeld and the NBA on NBC and the news and Jay Leno and so forth. And really in this era of disaggregated content, in a certain sense, the news is the last man standing as far as brand is concerned. People still very much identify Brian Williams with NBC and, and, and also the news 
the way it's presented, that sensibility with NBC's sensibility, possibly as a whole. And I'm wondering, from your perspective, when you present the news, do you think about it as simply, here's how we're going to present the news, just as an editorial function, or do you actually think about how your presentation of the news will uphold and represent the entire network's brand? Well, um, we certainly think about uh, every story we report and how it reflects on ABC News, uh, which, I mean, the brand for ABC News consists basically of its credibility. If people don't believe we're telling them things because they think they're true, then, it, then it's not going to work. And that affects, obviously, our choices about who presents it. I will say, and uh, listen, I'm, I'm not a researcher, and so I'm not going to vouch for this, but there's been a big brand study that's been done uh, out of the Disney brand uh, function that Michael created about ABC that actually concluded to some people's surprise that in fact ABC is a brand. Now, I raise this in part because it's pertinent to your question. I raise it also because it's self-serving because what it also said is what drives that brand more than anything else are tw uh, GMA number one, World News Tonight number two, and uh, 2020 number three. Uh, now, partly that's because we're just around so doggone long. Uh, you know, unlike a drama, even a successful drama, it's there six, seven, eight years. We've got programs that are around for 20, 30 years which reinforces it, but also it's a daily program. People see us all the time, and they start to relate to Charlie Gibson or Diane Sawyer or, or whoever. So there is some evidence, at least, that there is a brand and that the news drives the brand disproportionately, more than you would think. Yeah, brand, branding is, that's, this is a dangerous course. You know, NBC is not a brand, in my opinion. Uh, Brian Williams is known to be on Channel 4 for people to get him on Channel 4, not even on NBC. It's still localism. The Yes, NBC for a while was known as uh, the Cosby Show and whatever, and ABC earlier than that was Happy Days, Laverne and Shirley. And, you know, it shifts according to what the program is. And the greatest thing about being a programmer is that, first of all, young kids will go anywhere. So if there's a good show, they don't care what the brand is. People under college age, they mostly will go anywhere. You know, when you get to be my age, you, you stay with Crest until you goes dark, and then you'll maybe go to another toothpaste. But generally, people follow the content. And this idea of brands being ubiquitous leads you to think you can do average work. And you can get away with it for a while. It's a little like a pointless painting, which a brand is a pointless painting with thousands of dots, and each dot makes up the brand. And these thousands of dots together end up with a beautiful picture. And a couple of bad dots probably won't hurt it. But it is not only one or two things. And there are very few companies that can maintain a brand. Coca-Cola can probably maintain a brand. Kodak did for a long time maintain a brand. Disney had lost a brand because of the quality of its product and brought it back. Uh, the, the, the idea of, of abdicating the fundamental work of what is the story, and I don't agree that YouTube is very good. I believe it is OK. I believe it gives consumers at an inexpensive price the ability to, to, to express themselves, which is great. And you know a lot of it is, is repurposed stuff that you catch up with. But eventually, the internet will gravitate toward people using this inexpensive technology, these uh, cameras and lighting and technology that you can use, inexpensive uh, new people, actors and so forth that are coming into the business, and create really excellent stories. And America is not ADD, which everybody thought. They only watch 30 seconds on the internet or two minutes, and then they can't do it. Uh, we started with two minutes in one of my shows. We went to six, we went to seven, then Hulu put on a lot of off-network stuff, ABC.com put on off-network stuff. And what do you know? The audience has stayed for 30 minutes on the internet because the show was good enough. But I, I, I don't think YouTube is good. I think it's incredibly useful. It's, it's, a, uh, it's a search engine for video. And uh, it, it, it is a, a tool, as they say. But just going back to, uh, you know, I, to your point about Brian Williams. I mean, Brian Williams, I think, is obscure to 80% of Americans. I don't think they didn't have a clue who Brian Williams was. <laughs> Uh, and, and it's interesting, Brian Williams is probably pretty well watched in, in comparison. You know, maybe his show gets six million viewers or something. No, like nine. Nine? Nine, okay. nine and a half. But 
John Stewart, who gets a million viewers, maybe, uh, is much better known because Brian, you know, because Brian Williams is is putting on his father's clothes and trying to be a version of the past. John Stewart represents something that people feel passionate about, and you know, the, the future is about passion, not about not about what Brian Williams represents. And, and distinctiveness, passion and distinctiveness. Uh, the, the evening newscasts right. are not sufficiently distinctive one from the other. There is no other John Stewart. Can I right. just? Uh, yeah, please. Yes, sorry. So, so I agree with you that I think that. Great content basically defines and builds and creates a brand. On the flip side, I would add to that though, as the world gets more and more cluttered and it's harder to find what you want, and, or it becomes more of an on-demand world, brand becomes critically important as a navigator and an editor for you. Because they trust right. that your right. brand will find the content. Exactly, right. and right. then to launch your new great content, You've got to have, your brand has got to be front and center to ensure that they can find it. But if you do a series of bad pieces, they eventually will yes. go you somewhere will lose else. The trust. Sure. We have time for one more up here. And I fear it may take us in a, in a longer direction, so I'll try to pose it as a yes or no question. But <laughs> to move away from content to distribution, I, as, as a consumer, genuinely am curious. I, I can surmise some of the reasons for this that are obvious, but. What I really want to know is, in my lifetime, will there be really full, um, comprehensive on-demand? That's one of the things that, that drives me crazy. I sit in my living room, and I want to watch what I want to watch when I want to watch it, and we've got the capability. I can kind of go through the lame choices of movies that my cable provider gives me, and live sports and live news are different. But when, when are we going to, will we get full on-demand in my lifetime? Well, when is not susceptible to a yes or no answer, right? <laughs> but uh, f when is not susceptible to a yes or no answer. I mean, <laughs> will we? Will we? I'm yes. I'm I mean, I'll, I'll go first. Absolutely, yes. If you just look at the progress of television, I'll take news again, but it's true for entertainment. Over the last 20 or 30 years, we've gone from you've got to sit in your bark of laundry at a certain time and watch the program on one of three channels to having a lot more consumer demand and ability to express that consumer demand, and it's all the things we've been talking about. The, the logical extension of that, I believe we will get to, others might disagree, is basically we don't actually push out anything. We have a server, and you come into our server, and you access it through your iPhone or if you're your Blackberry or your television set, your 70-inch plasma screen or however you want to do it, when you want to do it. It's the logical extension of what's been happening. I believe we will get there. I, 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 can't, I, I haven't a clue uh, to, to answer a question, but, but uh, I do see this sort of mashup world uh, I was thinking, actually, I watch a lot of Turner Classic movies. It, it, you know, it's probably been my staple channel. And, you know, there's Robert Osborne, he sits in this fake living room set, and he introduces in a rather pleasing, avuncular, old-fashioned kind of way some pretty good old movies. But I was thinking that what broadband will allow is, say, you know, you'll be able to go to Martin Scorsese's site or Judd Apatow's site or Will Farrell's site, and they'll say... I just watched this movie and here it is because they'll be able to link to the Warner Brothers cache of Warner Brothers movies or whatever. And they'll be able to say, just go and look at this clip. And uh, people will be able to write with their experiences of seeing movies. And uh, Michael Mann will say, my movie is opening, but here are the movies that influence me. I, th I think that is, th th there's also this combination of some of the, the uh, traditional pleasures of television with the kind of editing uh, that, that Andrea is talking about that I think is going to be very exciting and is going to provide, it's not necessarily about providing more new stuff. It is about finding the good stuff because one of the issues that we all have is that you know, TV Guide is dead. The Sunday newspapers don't cover TV, uh, they don't have TV supplements. It's actually almost impossible to know what is on the television yeah. any longer. And I think one of the great, it's, it's not that we need more television so much as it would be great to be able to understand what's great about what is actually available to us already. And uh, so, you know, I think, it, 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 although in theory it would be great to have everything available, you could drown in that. And, and the ability for, and, and we're all going to need help in finding and, and uh, seeing the great stuff from the past and the present. That, 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 can often get that can often get buried? The answer is totally yes, and that is really the crack up of television. Because what's going to happen is everything will be available on demand. Therefore, sell through is disappearing. Demand is subscription or free. Uh, 
the, the, the cream on the financial cream on the, the movie, talking about movies and also television cream, is the uh, video, particularly in movies, it is the sell through. That will go away. So, how to monetize 100% on demand is what the CEOs are probably worrying about at the studios, and they have to solve. If they don't solve it, and there, there will be a, a, a time when it will not be solved. During that time, if these studios do not want to go under, and most of them are conglomerates, so this will not make them go under, but it's a real issue, is they're going to have to produce at a much lesser cost because the on-demand is uh, a self rule you make $12, a on-demand, you'll make a dollar maybe. And unless it's completely ubiquitous worldwide, that's a big gap. So that's, if there is a crack up place, he put his finger on it, in the ch and it's just a change, and somebody's gotta come up with a model for it. But in the end, I mean, this has been, thank you all very much, a very encouraging conversation for the consumer. Um, we're facing a world of, of, of uh, almost infinite options, uh, uh, infinite creativity, um, constant production, some pro cost problems, but we'll get over them. So thank you for, uh, for participating and for giving us a pretty upbeat take. Thank you.